A special guest in the building, Mr. Jerry Heller. How you doing, sir? Hey, man. Oh, good to see you, man. Man, I it's an honor to have you in the building. Oh, thanks. Like you just heard Fuck the Police. When you hear those songs, what memory does it bring you back to? Well, you know, everything involved with NWA uh, obviously makes me think about my business associate Easy. So, you know, it takes me back to a time which was a happier time. And, uh, you know, but I think about him all the time and he was just a good guy, you know? Yeah, he was, he was, he was, a, he was a, a great guy. I, I got a chance to, you know, meet him a couple of times. He was definitely a great guy. So let's take it very, let's take it way back. You had, you had a book that you just uh, put out not too long ago called uh, Ruthless. That's correct. And, and like we was talking off air, like everybody's told the story in their perspective everybody from the 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 water guy to whoever was around it has told the story but nobody really hears your story what made you write a book well i walked into barnes and noble one day and saw a book called can't stop won't stop the music by jeff chang who i consider the leading authority on hip-hop in the world yeah and it was on the front table and i said you know maybe now's the time for me to write a book because I don't like to do things that I don't think are going to be important. Yeah. So I, um, I wrote this book and I wanted to establish Easy's legacy and maybe clear up all the misconceptions about he and I. So that's what I did. And I thought the book went a long way in doing that. What was one of the biggest misconceptions? I mean, we heard the story, but what was <laughs> one of the bis- biggest mis- misconceptions you wanted to clear up? Well, you know, it's really a joke in this day and age for people to think that you can steal money in a record in the record business. Yeah. It's not possible. When, when the uh, we would we would get the numbers at the end of the quarter. Yeah, Easy and I, his business manager would go over them. Um, we would send them to our lawyers. Our lawyers would go over them. The accountants would then drop all the paperwork. Then we would send it to the guys, whether it was Cube or whoever, his business manager and his lawyer. Yeah. It was all done by computer. You know, to think about that a picture of Easy and I sitting there late at night with green eyeshadows on cooking the books, it's just a joke. It's not possible. Yeah. So anyone that even would would believe something like that, it's ridiculous. And a friend of mine named Big Reg said to me, you know, in my world, man, if you don't deny something, people believe it's true. Yeah. And I said, no, nobody is going to really believe that we we stole money from these guys. That's just that's crazy. I mean, everybody made so much money. Do you think anyone had to steal from anyone? I mean, does Dr. Dre have enough money? Does Ice Cube have enough money? Yeah. I mean, Dr. Dre was the leading earner. In show business last year, he made $675 million. Ice Cube's first movie that he did with uh, whatever the, the comic's name is, it's $170 million domestic. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's just a joke. One thing you said in the book that I found it kind of like, like, <clears throat> wow. You said, if I stole from these guys, why didn't they never sue me? Well, I think that's a really good point. That That's pretty... That's pretty no, fair. No. That's pretty fair. It's the right. same. Nobody ever sued, so obviously they were just using it as an excuse in the in the, in Compton or wherever to say, you know, we got rid of the white guy, you know, because you know he was helping Easy Steel or whatever. But you know, it's uh, nobody ever sued me, and nobody ever sued him. So obviously, it was all bullshit. Exactly. It's funny because my cousin was grew up around the whole. Uh, NWA. He was actually around Easy probably two months before he passed away. And one thing my cousin said to me recently, because I was telling him about you coming to the show or whatever, he said that I was around Easy a lot, and Easy never spoke bad about Jerry Heller. Easy was like my flesh and blood son. He said, I mean, and, we did everything together, and that's what he said. He said that I don't know where all this hate is coming from because Easy never said anything bad about this guy. Well, we were very close. We lived next door to each other. We ran a company together. We each had our own areas of responsibility and authority. 
And we built, next to David Geffen, we built the biggest empire in the history of, of the music business. You did, you did. And with your book, it's funny, because the first thing, when I, when I got the book in the mail, and I read the book, I was like, I was like, there's one thing missing off of this cover. And I know you did, it was, it was probably strategic. You put a picture of NWA on the cover of the book without Ice Cube. Was that on purpose? Well, that particular picture was done in 1991. It was for the cover of Newsweek magazine. Yeah. Done by a very famous photographer who's a very dear friend of mine now named Lynn, Lynn Goldsmith. She was Bruce Springsteen's private photographer, and that's how I met her. But he just wasn't in the group at that time. And those were the pictures that I liked, and those were the pictures that we used. Okay, okay. Because I, 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 as, as reading your book, you know, say you didn't really like Ice Cube and he didn't really like you. That's, that's, that's what I got out of the, 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 um, the conversations that, that, that you talked about via your book or whatever. Um, as far as Ice Cube, what was the beef between him and you? Because you knew Ice Cube before you met Easy, right? Because well, he was in CIA and he was around McCola Records before, before you even got it started Ruthless Records, correct? Yeah. I, I, I knew Ice Cube perif peripherally before I met Easy, but he was younger. Easy was my guy. I mean, I hung out with Easy. Ice Cube was just a member of the group. And Ice Cube can talk about how he wrote all the lyrics, but if you look at every NWA song, there's only one person that did everything on every, uh, did something on every single NWA song, and that was Andre Romel Young. Yeah. Dr. Dre, he wrote the music for every song that ever came out on Ruthless. The, the lyrics, each guy wrote his own lyrics. So if you look at these songs that he claims that he wrote, there was always four or five lyric writers on those songs. He was younger than the other guys. He lived at home with his mother and father. Um, he didn't really hang out with us. Um, and... He was very, very jealous of Easy, and of course, he was jealous of the relationship between Easy and I. It was funny you said they were, he was jealous of all the guys because they got more pussy to him. Well, is that true? <laughs> well, I think I think that it was true. I mean, the other guys were, you know, I mean, they really were really into it. Ice Cube lived at home with his parents. Yeah, and you know, he oh, he. I, I remember once he said. Yeah, they all had these big houses, and I lived at home with his parents. He lived at home with his parents because he was younger, and his mother wanted him to live at home. His mother was a very lovely, articulate woman. You know, he grew up in a very good family. He went to Taft High School, and uh, he just wasn't, you know, he wasn't really a street guy. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and, and it's, I've heard this rumor, and I want to see how, how, how true this rumor is. Was the straw that broke the camel's back for Ice Cube leaving the fact that DLC got a solo record before him? Well, I've never heard. That's an interesting question, and I've never heard that. I think that the reason that he left was, look, we were with Brian Turner yeah. at Priority. Brian Turner and Pat Charbonnet kept telling him that he should be a solo artist. And while I don't blame Brian Turner, although I blamed him for a while, I don't blame him for that. He enabled Ice Cube to leave, to do, to pursue a solo career. Actually, the next album on our schedule was going to be an Ice Cube solo record. But really, Easy and Dre made those decisions. Easy conceptualized, and Dre musicalized. I financialized, and. You know, just for the sake of poetry, I always said that, that Ice Cube verbalized. But, um, you know, that was Dre's decision. Look, I, I could never get Dre to do a second record with Michelet. His first re her first record sold millions of copies. Yeah, it did. And it was the first R&B record ever done to hip-hop tracks. And I could never get him to do another record with her. So, I, you know, Dr. Dre was his own man. And <clears throat> he did things that kept him interested. And what he was interested in at that time was doing uh, an album with one of the most prolific of the ruthless writers, 
fact, uh, the DOC. I still think the DOC is probably the greatest pure rapper that ever lived. It's funny you said it because I've we've been doing we've been doing this show for a couple years now, and I say if he didn't have that accident and mess up his throat, we would be talking about the DOC the way we talk about Tupac and Biggie and Jay Z and all the rest of this. And because of his his writing ability and the way he you know structured songs, I thought he was one of the, he he would have been one of the greatest if he didn't have that car accident. I really thought that he and Rakim were probably the two best rappers of pure rappers of all time. And he was a great writer of the DOC, and uh, you know that accident was very unfortunate. Was that his second car accident? That was only the first that I know about. Okay, because I, I thought he had, he had a second, you know, drunken driving car accident or whatever. You no, know, that was the first one that that I knew about. And uh, so, what was your beef with him? Because I know in your book, you said that Easy let the snake in the building. When the DLC was like the fifth Beatle in the group, what was your beef with him? He brought in Suge Knight. Oh, that's true. Okay, so so Suge Knight was was his guy, oh. and he brought Suge Knight around. And I always Suge Knight to me marked the end of fun in hip hop. Before that, it was fun. We all had fun, man. Yeah. After Suge Knight got involved, there was no more fun. There were guys sitting in our office with Uzis twenty four hours a day. You know, so. He changed the entire complexion of of what was happening at Ruthless. When that happened, when that whole thing with Easy happened and this whole Suge Knight thing was happening, why did you stick around? Why didn't you, you know, take your ball and go home? Or why didn't you say, you know what, this is too much shit going on. I have enough money. Let me just get out of Dodge. Um, of all the things that I've done in my career, including bringing Elton John here. Pink Floyd, Marvin Gaye, Styx, Journey, Ario Speedwagon, of all the people that I've been involved with, the most important part of my career was from March 3rd of 1987 to March 26th of 1995. So there was no question that I, of me going somewhere. And Dre came to my house one day. We lived right you know, right around the corner from each other. We all lived there together and said, hey man, you picked the wrong nigger. And I said, hey man, I go home from the dance with who I came with. He came to your door and said that to you? Well, I was standing in the driveway. Oh, he okay. came over. We were neighbors, you know. And he said that. And Doug Young, who was the head of promotion at Ruthless at the time, said, look, you better start taking Dre more seriously because, you know, this Suge Knight is really... Is really blowing smoke up his ass, and and he did. And obviously, you know, Dre was willing to leave death row with nothing. He walked out with no masters, no money, nothing. So obviously, he made the wrong mistake. Yeah. I made his deal with Jimmy Iovine. So that deal, which is the deal that he lives with today, which made him close to a billionaire, um, so his aftermath deal with Interscope, you actually... I made Dre's deal with Interscope. Okay. Um, Dre had a, a company that he was going to call Defro. And the, the title... D-E-F, right? The yeah. title Defro was owned by Unknown DJ. So after he left, I had made a deal with him, with Irving Azoff and Mo Austin, but it was right about the time of... Um, cop killer okay. when when Warner Brothers was dropping they dropped Ice Cube I mean Ice T yeah. so I had made a deal with them where Dre was going to get his own company and Easy and I were going to own 20% of it I made that deal with Irving Azoff and Mo Austin but Mo Austin then backed off of hip hop and the deal fell apart and Suge was able to come in and try and make a deal with him first with Sony with Hank Caldwell, and then wound up making, you know, wound up getting Interscope interested, Step Johnson, and uh, I, I wound up making that deal between us and Jimmy, because Jimmy called me and he said, listen, Jerry, I will never buy a lawsuit with you, but I feel that Dre will never record for you again. I thought that was true, so I discussed it with Eric, and I said, listen, Eric, you know, Interscope wants to make a deal with for us with Dre, and I believe Jimmy when he says that Dre is, will never do anything for us again. 
So I did what I could to maintain and preserve the integrity of the of Dr. Dre, which was the assets that asset that we owned that we then sold to the Interscope. And of course, the, you know, it made Interscope what it is today. And certainly has been okay for Dre too, since he is a billionaire. That's crazy. So let's let's take a little break right now. Let's-